Thank you all, and thank Jens. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, the next keynote speaker, Brigitte Baptiste, today. Although it is also kind of a challenging task. Due to her exceptional level of activity within academic, activist, public, and political engagement in and beyond Colombia, across the fields of landscape ecology, biodiversity, environmental politics, LGBT and queer politics, and indigenous activism, uh, you can kind of get your head to buzz when you read through all her work. As a cultural landscape ecologist, Baptiste has dedicated much of her work to the biodiversity of land use change, uh, its forces, its history, its meaning, and political management. This has not only led her to become one of Latin America's kind of former and central academic experts uh, and innovative thinkers around biodiversity, but also a highly respected activist. Um, and her track record of kind of environmental politics goes way back. She co-founded the environmental nonprofit Cor um, Corporación Grupo Ecológico in 1982 and served as his co or as his director for close to a decade. She's been a consultant for numerous um, environmental nonprofits such as WWF Colombia. She also has a long academic background. Um, she's been a professor at the Institute of Environmental Studies. Um, and development at the Pontificial University in Bogota. And then since 2011, uh, she's been the general director of the prestigious Humboldt Research Institute um, of Environmental Studies, no, oh, uh, Humboldt Research Institute of Biological Resources, I'm sorry. She's the author of 15 books. She has a popular TV series. She has a column in the newspaper um, and much more. And furthermore, she's been active in the piece Treat, uh, peacemaking process in between FARC and the government in Colombia, which has worked specifically to raise awareness of the ecological challenges in this post-conflict period, as large regions of the country's uh, green areas that has been inaccessible um, for at least the general populace due to the civil war and landmines and so forth, is slowly becoming accessible, leading to kind of a rush for economic extraction of land um, uh, by means of deforestation, agricultural development, with large consequences for um, not only the indigenous populations and the Afro-Caribbean communities um, in the area, but also for biodiversity more generally, as these areas of Colombian forest and greens supposedly holds around 10% of the world's biodiversity. So despite the kind of political context of her work, we don't necessarily always hear so much about Colombian politics, at least not in Denmark. Maybe the newspaper likes to write about Narcos, the series, so that's kind of the level, I guess, of debate sometimes. But earlier this week, there were a news story from the Colombian political president that went viral, which maybe says something about what can news stories circulate, but it kind of felt relevant to some degree for this um, event today. The headline that caught my attention, The Guardian read, quote, swarm of angry bees attack Colombian presidential election rally. And it reported from a rally in the ongoing um, election process in Colombia where the former president, Alvaro uh, Uribe, was campaigning for the right-wing presidential candidate, Ivan Ducou, in the city of La Lime. But Uribe's address to the audience was uh, cut short by a so-called swarm of angry killer bees that allegedly attacked the right-wing presidential candidate leaving 15 people hospitalized temporarily at least. Um, it didn't go long before a senator tweeted bioterrorism um, in response to the news, accusing the leftist presidential candidate, Gustavo Petro, to be behind the attack uh, from what was reported as Africanized bees. Another far-right former governor tweeted in a similar vein, quote, before they threw grenades and mortars, now it's bees underlining not only the great divide in the understanding of the peace treaty between FARC and the government, but also, um, um, uh, of course, the question of biology in play here. Although biologists noted that it probably was the presidential use of a helicopter that kind of made the bees angry. Um, uh, the news story, I guess, is telling example of the racialized political mobilization of the biosphere um, in this contentious political present in Colombia and uh, beyond and how nature is taken into account and is read through racialized, gendered, and sexualized um, um, modes of thinking. I maybe wouldn't be surprised if the Colombian right wing also would see Baptiste herself as a kind of bioterrorist of sorts, as her environmental activism is clearly going against not only the uh, political attempts to retract the peace tre treaty, but also against the conservative politics concerning diversity in the sphere not only of nature, but also of culture. 
As a queer scholar, I'm particularly inspired by Baptiste's work and what she has been working on around the concept of queer ecology, which is central for also her talk here today. I think many of us coming from the humanities, working with the politics of gender, sexuality, and race, have for good reason been skeptical to kind of almost everything biological, uh, due, of course, to the, to the kind of essentialist thinking that has been used as a security instrument, um, to use Kyla Schiller's term in one of yesterday's session, to regulate di the diversity of bodies, genders, and sexualities. The resistance to certain kind of ideology of biological thinking um, has maybe made some of us refrain from, from even engaging with biology at all, uh, and kind of just leaving that sphere uh, behind. But I think Baptiste's work and her lecture today reminds us that, to quote her, there is nothing more queer by nature than nature itself, uh, and that there are indeed multiple ways that a kind of queering of biology can enable us also in the humanities to rethink understandings of transformation, change, and movement. And this is also a kind of a central point that she will address um, today in her talk called Queering Ecology in Trans Colombia. So, thank you. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Dennis, for inviting me. Thank you, Matthias, for the kind words uh, to start. And uh, as you see, uh, the initial subject is precisely the discussion about the peace process uh, in Colombia, which is still is quite a hot issue. And that's the reason why I won't be tomorrow with you, because I have to fly back and vote uh, on Sunday. So that's going to be a huge uh, struggle between the right and the left, which were the, the, the selected uh, candidates for the second round, and it probably there's many, many things at stake, like many other countries nowadays. But uh, I would like to mention some of the um, contested fields that uh, are related to the discussion of uh, environmental policy and diversity and biodiversity in Colombia during the uh, the campaigns and during the last year, and see how, what is going to happen probably during uh, the next uh, months. So, of course, highlight the picture of the peace, and the word peace is always linked to white. So everybody is wearing white uh, attires and white guayaberas, uh, and the Cuba Cuban uh, signature of the agreements. A bit more than a year ago, the Colombian government signed peace with the FARC rebels after 53 years of upheaval. That's my age. Despite the president being rewarded with the Nobel Prize of Peace, half of the country population, more or less, according to the polls, is still reluctant to accept the treaty, even if endorsed by the international community, the national courts, and the Congress. Arguments against the peace agreements uh, were mostly, and still are mostly, fueled by the classical narratives of fear to communism taking over government. Uh, there's less than 20,000 uh, rebels now trying to make their lives after the peace signature. So the idea that they will take over the country is quite naive. Uh, different ideas of Justice after war, that's the most complicated issue. After 53 years of combat, there's plenty of uh, complicated uh, relations amongst victims and, uh, and, and victimaries from both sides. And most surprisingly, the rejection of the gender equity building agenda. So that was defined at the end of uh, 2016, uh, the uh, the balance of the vote towards no, we don't want to uh, uh, support the peace treaty. So it was kind of really, really backlash for us all after four years of negotiation. So we are still trying to understand the links between this, uh, uh, these narratives of gender and non-friendly uh, gender um, 
issues and uh, the relation with, with the rest of the peace agreement. Um, I think that the, there's lots of contradictions, of course, in this, uh, in this discussion, and most of them could be related to socio-ecological change in Colombia, uh, because after so many years, it's kind of difficult to have a shared vision of, of the country. Uh, <coughs> who, has, who is living in the country nowadays after such a large conflict uh, with seven million of displaced people, uh, people that is now living in cities and it has, uh, it's living in other countries. So the, the, the current vision of, of what is Colombia is uh, it's quite changed, I think. And uh, then, well, strong ontological contradictions may lay behind this unfortunate situation and revision of the ways by which knowledge for decision-making is built in Colombia is necessary and may be used for adaptation to global change as well as for peace-building and sustainability. So. A bit more also, also a bit more than a year ago, some colleagues and I introduced the idea of greening the peace. And I think that that's the message that Jens received when he asked me to come and talk in the Green Conference. Uh, it was an attempt at that time to provocate a debate of the importance of biodiversity in the past conflict society. This proposal, the proposal was based on the need to identify new political and territorial scenarios to develop a transitions proposal. Um, moving from the current situation of the most important social ecosystems in Colombia to a much more sustainable one. Considering diversity as a key player and based on our general understanding of the driven drivers of environmental change involved. But it's a window of opportunity. If we sign peace and we have uh, access, all, all, all Colombians can start talking about the future, well, why don't we use this opportunity to revisit our idea of uh, the ecosystems in Colombia, what's the kind of the material or the stuff what we are going to use to build a new kind of society. Uh, this is a map that was produced during this, uh, the, in that paper, and you see there in the red dots the regions that are most complicated. Here and here, this is the Amazon in green, of course, and the red is humans eating the forest. Um, the departure point for, for my activities in, in such a, uh, a quest are related completely to my work at Instituto Humbo, the National Institute for Biodiversity. And uh, it's very important for me to, to, um, to convey this vision that I'm part of, uh, uh, of the state. Uh, and, but Humboldt is a mixed institution. I will go back to that in a minute, but uh, that makes me, uh, my, my views and the Instituto views are very, very positioned and, uh, and yeah, you see why. <coughs> So we have been working, and we as Instituto Humboldt, 250 people and networks of networks around the country. Uh, we're working for 25 years, and we are dedicated to do research to improve the quality of decision making. And that's our goal, mostly among government, but also among all Colombians, communities, private entities, and all institutions, as well as the general public. And uh, the basis of this work, of course, is the green stuff that is nature or is biodiversity. This is kind of a replace, replacement uh, between those words. And uh, uh, mm, from this green stuff, we derive all sorts of things. And uh, those things have uh, lots of contested meanings. 
because what is really biodiversity? What does it mean to be one of the richest countries on biodiversity in the world? Uh, as Matthias mentioned, 10% or more of the species of the world are believed to be or are reported to be in Colombia. Uh, it's the, high, the richest country on birds, 1900 types of birds, and the, the, the numbers are really high on every uh, biological group you mention. So, but that's the meaning of that. That's kind of the big question we have to, to address. And uh, uh, of course, the, the discussion for us is uh, quite nice because nobody challenges the, the uh, goodness of the, the wonders of biological diversity. And everybody tells us, oh, what a nice job you have. It's, it's pretty, you always are thinking about uh, nice things, birds, butterflies, and I would love to work uh, in, in your place. Well, it's nice, of course, but uh, it's not uh, free of lot of trouble, especially when we have to think about what to do with this knowledge, what to do with this green stuff, as I mentioned. <coughs> Humboldt Institute is hybrid, and uh, we're starting to do some bizarre uh, acknowledgements. We have public duty, we are part of the state at some point, and we have funds for doing our research. But also we work as a consortium made up from universities, uh, from NGOs, and from other public uh, institutions. So we have a kind of a seed capital that comes from the taxes to fulfill some uh, functions, but we also have to raise money to uh, complete an agenda that is defined by the owners of the institute, which are um, uh, those that I mentioned. So, uh, to facilitate our operation, we have a private legal regime. This creates a first set of identity problems. Uh, our Humboldt Institute is weird according to other institutions in the country. We are not easily located into the map of institutions. We are not part of the public servants scheme. Uh, we don't have the same salaries than the universities, not the, from public servants. Uh, and so we have lots of autonomy and independence, which is not always uh, well seen. Uh, so um, we have uh, kind of some tasks, very specific tasks that are in the, in, the, in the slide. I won't read them, but probably the most important thing is that Humboldt serves as a science policy interface. So we have to convey to the governments, I mean governments, the national government and regional governments, with ideas about what is the importance of biodiversity, what to do with this green stuff and uh, what are the opportunities and risks uh, related to that action. And of course, if you think on, on bringing uh, this, uh, this material to the governments, you need to bring it in uh, on, on a timely uh, frequency because they need things urgently, always. They need knowledge for tomorrow. They need to solve things in a few hours and then we cannot produce that, oh, sometimes that, that kind of knowledge in such a hurry. And also with limited resources. Um, the, and then science keeps complaining that, well, we, we don't have time, we are bounded. And I, I'm sure that here as well in Denmark and in everywhere, um, scientists complain about rushing for knowledge production and about limited resources. But then if you compare with uh, huge biodiversity and a huge ecological complexity and social complexity and very, very, very small, and I'm talking about a, a thousandfold of the budgets that are used in some other countries for dealing with that, uh, the, the asymmetry is really huge. Um, we are lucky, though. Uh, nature in Colombia is magnificent, of course, it's green, and now uh, it's uh, honoring uh, the request of, of the of the conference. Um, 
it comes in many shapes and types nature. For example, here you see is uh, one of the most beautiful landscapes of Colombia, the high Andean palm forest, a national symbol. The palm is, was chosen as the national symbol in, 18, in 1985. It's an endemic species also, and 90% of its population live fragmented in less than 100 kilometers, square kilometers. So it's a very small spot of land where harbors 90% of the population, which is kind of less than a million palms that remains on, on the world. Um, the efforts to save the palm from extinction have been relatively successful, uh, despite we have been unable to create a conservation area for, uh, to save this, the population. Uh, since it, the, the, those palms live in a heavily transformed region, there is no formal conservation category available. So the government says, yes, we would love to preserve this, value, this valuable landscape, this wonderful natural wild ecosystem, but you know, it's too small for a national park. It's too small for a forest reserve. It's, it's, it, it will cost us lots on, 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 on budget and, and requirements, or legal requirements to protect it. So let's leave it that way. So the national tree is not being protected or it's just protected by local communities and the owners of the, of the land. Uh, they are mostly wealthy and well-respected cattle ranchers. You don't see here the cattle is uh, down the, the, the screen. And uh, they love the palms. They are very proud of the landscape, but still there's mining requirements for this region. There's offers to uh, build hotels and roads and, and to open that for eco-tourism in the future. To our dismay, recent scientific news, so such recent as April this year, reported that Ceroxylion kindiwense, the Latin name of the plant, is transsexual. A new scientist, it's cut, I think, a bit of the title, but the, 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 the palm changes sex. Uh, usually, when they got 50 years old, the flowers change their morphology, and, uh, well, then you see a, a national institute that is hybrid, lots of troubles of identity, and dealing with a forest of a palm which is transsexual. There's no other option <laughs> for us than to talk seriously about querying of life in Colombia. But of course this is easy than talk about the meaning of life. We don't want to, to do that at this moment, but sometimes querying is a uh, it's a good enough adventure. Ecological change at the scale of the country must be addressed while mourning butterflies in Bogota streets claim for empathy. They don't want to be murdered anymore because of their gender or sexual preferences. Those are ladies that are uh, obliged to work as sexual workers in the streets and uh, they perform during the day to uh, reach attention from the press and uh, ask for protection from the police abuse or from other forces that kill them at night. Um, well, so let me share a bit of a heroic perspective. Our institute is speaking with the voice of the 13 institutions that agreed to create it and to support the production of relevant knowledge about biodiversity to build social well-being without destroying that biodiversity, have the duty to promote transitions. That's so that's kind of the, our task, to promote transitions. Of course, not sex change, don't um, misunderstand me. Uh, it's ecological transitions. With this in mind, I would like to share some reflections that fit our task first. Uh, we need to acknowledge that there's some trends and early signs of this transitioning. There's lots of things going on in the world uh, about going to a more um, 
say more um, more sustainable um, relation between society and so-called nature. I have troubles with that. Um, and uh, this ecological and social change is linked, is interlinked, and uh, it happens every day. It's permanent. And the inclusion of biodiversity in the practices and life of Colombians has a history as ancient as the people of the country, close to 15,000 years. Not much. But more important, in the context of post-conflict, we must keep in mind that the changing views and meanings that are behind the idea of nature, of the green, clearly identified as this is tough for doing things, or for undoing things also. There are other questions to be made, but here I must acknowledge that I stand alone. I won't compromise any of my colleagues from this point onwards, even if many have helped to build this reflection. Uh, Humboldt Institution, being official, uh, don't speak about querying ecology. It's me. But of course, it's me asking my colleagues what kind of nature are we helping to produce by our research? Uh, I, it's my question to the scientific directorate of the institution on what uh, is the result, what is the, uh, the quality of information and knowledge that is being transmitted to the society and that now is mostly being, uh, being uh, viewed as kind of an authoritarian and well-respected uh, knowledge for decision-making, which scares me a lot. Um, and you'll see onwards the extreme and contradictory views of land ecologies and uh, the right ways of being there in the land, I mean, uh, because there's plenty of ontologies which are in conflict. They share a vision of the country which is not uh, on place. So, the, the, the idea is if we can focus a bit on the new ways of governing uh, the country, of governing ourselves into this shaking arena uh, that is produced by the post-conflict. And of course, which bodies, human and non-human bodies, will populate the country in the future? What kind of relations will they build? And you see, I'm talking ecology, but it's also uh, 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 highly relational view of everything. So there are some signs of this transitioning, as I mentioned. Mm. Uh, and, and an example, well, I would put some of those quickly. There are signs of transitioning after war, many, many people doing things, doing interesting things in the cities, in the, uh, in, in the, uh, in the rural countryside. But there's also a development model contested in the streets. In this window of opportunity, there's lots of people thinking we should go this way and we should go that way. Uh, there's also mutant worldviews, like everywhere. There's People is reinventing indigenous and local communities, is uh, inventing traditions or recovering tradition, is giving agency to many, uh, to, to species, to landscapes, to rivers, uh, to plants and animals. Also, there's policies involved. There's people already thinking on pushing those transitions, uh, some of them wider than others. Um, there's institutional innovation, there's lots of new ways of doing things and new types of agreements that are emerging from that discussion. And of course, at the end, I would like to talk about a bit of the queering ecology, more uh, from my side, but related to the quest of legitimacy of the multiple identities that populate this new world, this emerging world. And a bit of communication and unfolding um, uh, narratives. Um, there's a map of some uh, of the organizations that are working with the word peace and reconciliation and uh, I have to thank uh, Denmark and uh, 
European Union and many countries because they are putting lots of money on helping local communities and helping us to do this discussion to advance on the peace uh, process and uh, we'll see what happens in, in, in the future after the elections. But there's lots of hope, there's lots of uh, adaptive uh, proposals to, to live again in the forest, to live again with, within the thresholds of our um, ecological dynamics. Uh, but I must say that the, this idea of biodiversity as the green stuff still pervades. It's very little discussion on the nuances, on the components of that biodiversity. There's, um, And uh, I think that if you have read a bit of the papers or got the news, there's uh, an unfortunate event that is still unfolding and that synthesizes the socio-ecological conflicts in the contemporary Colombia. It's under the goal of producing clean energy by hydrogeneration, a huge dam is being built in a major river during the last five years. It's, the, it's almost completed, as you see in the picture. A couple of weeks ago, the dam started to collapse and could become a major human-caused disaster, probably the second largest in the world after Chernobyl. It's, there are 150,000 lives at stake living down the river that now are being evacuated and trying to relocate, to be relocated. The dam is holding, but nobody knows until when. But whatever happens, if the dam breaks, it will change the surface of a site double, double the size of London city. Um, uh, it's a, really a, a huge region that will uh, shift from uh, uh, an agricultural land to a wetland. And uh, if it doesn't, if it holds still, it will be very difficult to be back and live back in the region because of the fear of what could happen uh, in the future. So also the, the issue will change forever, the way we talk about nature, about river dynamics, about water and about ecosystem dynamics in Colombia. Um, of course, um, there's lots of discussion about extractivism and about the role of world trade and about industry, mining, oil, fracking, hydropowers, as you saw, industrial agriculture. And uh, this is so contested that there are more than 50 local processes for consultation against um, big interventions on, on, on the territory. The people doesn't want roads, they don't want bridges, they don't want uh, industrial agriculture, they don't want oil, and this consultation is going and there's lots of local unrest. And this is part of the discussion that is going to be uh, absolutely hard during the next months after the election. Uh, the big capital projects are being heavily scrutinized or fought against, and authoritarian reactions do not wait to follow. You know, if, if the legal development projects are contested, the government usually answers with a bit of negotiation capacity at the beginning and uh, quickly moves away from that and sends the army. And that's uh, what can happen in the future. So a growing need for clarity is being requested, especially to science, but usually this uh, clarity to solve these no's and yes, these do, do's and don'ts is not easy to provide because it doesn't exist. It's everything moves between a couple of extremes and none of those activities are really bad or good by itself. It depends on where, how and who uh, carries them on. At least three elements um, show how unclear is that reality and create ambiguity upon the old categories that seem to have been refined beforehand. 
History makes strange turns and promotes emerging arrangements or even the, or of even the simplest things. Cultural dynamics are based on such fast spreading of tendencies in an epidemic way, making it impossible to announce futures, least to predict them. Innovation runs so fast uncontrolled and the world seems to fall apart every day. Some issues, I picked them uh, from, from the news, what's happening in Colombia during the last 10 years. 75% uh, of the people has moved to cities, like everywhere, but in less than 20 years. It's a huge change, a huge shift. But they have moved with their animals and plants. So we have a new urban ecosystems everywhere and people trying to accommodate to this new uh, situation. There's mystical searches coming mostly for indigenous traditions, more than 80 different uh, groups, 100 possible. They have each their ways of doing things, of thinking about nature, of thinking about well, life, plants and animals and other and non-humans. And uh, uh, there's a kind of a hunger for answers uh, that is fueling discussions with those indigenous groups. And then the Constitutional Court has granted rights to nature in many movements during the last couple of years. Even they asked for a habeas corpus to a bear that was in a zoo. There were some people asking to free the bear under kind of the free willy arguments, uh, but the bear was born in captivity. And so he finally got at home, not, he was not released to the wild for his good. Uh, but then you see uh, this is in Spanish, sorry, but the, the court granted rights to a big river because it was polluted by gold miners. And the last movement was to declare the Amazon, the region, as also subject of rights. So we are working on how to uh, deal with, this, with those decisions. Who is speaking on the name of those new entities that are part of the decision system in Colombia? Um, let's see. Despite war, there can be changes. Transitions towards sustainability are already in place, as I mentioned. And there is enough room on those to accommodate many, if not all, socio-ecological experiments. Building sustainability means to navigate from a current situation to a better one, taking into account who says so and why. We have identified 10 major types of socially created ecosystems that are on the list, such as landscape types uh, that describe a particular way of relating to the land. Um, you can browse from the wild lands in Colombia, 60 to 70 percent of the country is still on the wild side, on the green, could be. Um, but if you add the numbers of those categories, you won't get 100 percent. That's because the, they mix them in many uh, locations. You cannot really discriminate between or clearly separate where's the cattle, where's the forest, where's the cities, everything is a bit mixed. Uh, and this is something complicated, especially because the state and everybody is asking to draw clear lines on the map. Just tell us where to produce sugarcane, where to produce oil palm, where to do oil uh, extraction. But there's major gray areas amongst the green. And also, no landscape is stable. Every day, things are changing. So the identity of those landscapes, of those socio-ecological uh, territories, is not well defined. It's very difficult to, to, to tell apart where is people doing conservation, by example, and when they are doing agriculture. And the government keeps asking to split both activities. Uh, and uh, just as, uh, as a story, a peasant asks the government formally, I own a hundred 
hectares, acres. 90 of those are on the wild, are green. I keep them because I love nature. 10% is used for sheep and goats growth. What's the title? What's the name of my activity? It's uh, cattle production, it's sheep production, or I am preserving nature in my, uh, in my plot. So for the government, he or she is doing agriculture, even if it's, it takes less than 10% of its land. And that makes lots of difference for taxes, for incentives, for rights definitions. And you need to start thinking on uh, much more um, discrete categories that link conservation, pure conservation or preservation, and uh, production in terms of agriculture, by example. So no category, nothing is really clear cut and is easily uh, differentiated in the land. And then you can shift from a forest to a city or from a wetland to a forest, and then you can do lots of engineering to say, uh, to change the uh, ecosystem, to change or to move the land from one situation to another. So those are the 10 transitions, and I'm afraid that the screen is cutting a bit of the, of the pictures, but those I won't read and go farther from them, but you'll see kind of the idea of going towards a more sustainable uh, ways of living in Colombia. Transitions are um, oh well. Uh, most, most social and ecological systems can move from one shape to another through time, and some transformations take more time and energy than others. Some are, most, are almost irreversible, and some are just not feasible. There are speeds and intensities of change, and we can assess its quality and the divergence from the standard sustainability pathway in the UK. Land grabbing, agriculture and cattle are still the major cause for wild land conversion, but there are many trajectories and drivers related to the process. Sometimes a process that is fully governed by mostly is the result of a handful of non-related reasons which bring uncertainty to the unfolding landscapes. The absence of the dominant governing forces after the agreements with FARC meant a void that still has not been compensated. Those releasing chaotic forces, including members of local institutions, taking advantage of it throughout corruption. Major landscape transformations are needed if we are going to accomplish the SDG agenda, agenda. but there's uh, really need for new types of governance on those uh, types of, of, of landscapes. Still, what is to be converted and into what? Transitions are being promoted as a challenge for stakeholders, which may vary in each situation. Most of them will evolve in the middle of struggles and discussions to distribute some of the iniquities that bake unsustainable practices as drivers of degradation. For that purpose, every stakeholder will try to build it, its best truths to eliminate uncertainty and to create sweet figures and sweet futures, plenty of goodwill, justice and promises. No single scientific approach would solve all contradictions. And yesterday we have some discussion in a group about uh, the way some stakeholders were building uh, and assembling scientific data, even about the most simple things such as absence or presence of uh, species, to prove that certain uh, actors or certain interests uh, had to be uh, promoted. Uh, bringing new meanings for biodiversity may help us to challenge a fixed idea of how nature is and how are we located in relation to it. In our terms, neoecologists may emerge from neontologies more suited to acknowledge the effects of the so-called Anthropocene in evolution. Perhaps we need to appeal to ways to illuminate reality 
quote unquote, from a different standpoint of view. Some that do not blind ourselves, or at least no other person's ability to approach things. That means not just to accept that there are other possible ontologies and epistemologies, but that we need them, and sometimes to our distress we have to promote. This in natural science is kind of the apocalypse. If you, if you say that you need to accept different types of ontologies, uh, you are just destroying the basis of biology, of modern biology. At least the definition of species and the idea of natural ecosystems are, are, are conservation objects. And uh, you'll see how it acts. Uh, there's lots of ways we try to convey this distress uh, throughout uh, communication strategies, trying to build new narratives, trying to get arts into the discussion. But uh, I, I had to tell we are not being, we are not succeeding. Science is absolutely, or at least so-called natural science, are reluctant absolutely rigid and they are not accepting this, uh, at least this challenge. So let me just give a, uh, show you a, a particular case for the discussion and then perhaps we can discuss a bit more afterwards. This is Chile Bequete, a recently declared national park in the middle of the Amazon. It's double the size of Denmark. It's surrounded by indigenous reserves and other protected areas that amount for half of the country forests, a piece of land larger than the UK. A vast and magnificent landscape of mixed rainforest, giant ancient plateaus and hundreds of places full of memories from first settlers. 14,000 years before our present, and perhaps still living in the region. The Carijonas, the ancient painters of ancient art, artists of the region, of the Chiribiquete walls have been declared extinct, but non-contacted tribes still thrive onto the green like ghosts. Places such as this non-green, Riverine vegetation are included into the largest protected area system of the Colombian Amazon, but are sadly threatened by deforestation. The biological identity of the red plant, but just confirmed recently, along with many other new species, many other new species of a region that was immersed on war, thus making it impossible to visit it. Just one year ago, we could, as biologists, go there and make a quick uh, evaluation assessment of biodiversity and we found dozens of new species for science and we could do a bit of ecology over there. But there's a paradox. Despite having signed a peace agreement with FARC, the government has been unable to control deforestation in the region, which has increased wildly. Illegal roads, coca plantations and land grabbing practices are replacing biodiversity with pastures in front of the world. Millions of dollars from international cooperation are being spent trying to correct a process that happens right in front of our sight. Yesterday, and I mean yesterday, the government's agency responsible for the monitoring of the forest in Colombia revealed that during 2017, more than 220 hectares of that green were lost in a growing trend. So deforestation is completely out of control. And you see the pictures. Those are pictures of this year in January and February. Frustration and a sense of meaningless efforts to avoid ecological destruction pervade. The Amazon forest is, in this part of Colombia has no value. It's invisible, at least not for the people who is cutting it, not the tree cutting people with the chonso but those who pay them, who provide them with tools, food, and even a salary. Those that, who will be part of the miserable in the future, landless, unemployed, 
displaced again. So the question would be why and how in the 21st century, with all of our capacities, satellites, communication devices, and institutional developments are we still blind to the forest richness, its contributions to national and global well-being and its importance as climate regulators? How come we cannot see its importance, its significance, despite of our scientific efforts and nice pictures? Why is the green invisible? And if you talk about people, uh, talk to people about rainforest in Colombia, the reaction would be, oh, this, this green stuff, the broccoli that you can see on the satellite and the aerial pictures. Yes, we can take off the broccoli, we can not even eat is it, but replace with something that is really valuable, such as cattle, oil palm, or other products. Their history on the maps as well. You see the green spot that was at least pre-Columbian environments in Colombia. The country which is really, really, really a uh, forest country. The yellow part is savanna, and the blue small dots are wetlands. And this is now the land use on, on Colombia. So you see all the yellow cutted forest. And I don't know why yellow is the color for, in, in the maps, the convention to um, show the replacement of forest. Um, then see. Suddenly, a different perspective, and suddenly I mean a couple of years ago, after those maps were produced, uh, a different perspective emerged after major flooding in 2011. Then it's more than the green in the land. Colombia is at least 30% made up of freshwater ecosystems. Blue ring expressed in the most recent, recent wetlands map of the country, which is on your right. And it was produced by Humboldt and other institutions. But this map on blue has still to be accepted by government. They are reluctant to acknowledge that Colombia is a country of wetlands. Because wetlands are very poorly defined on the law, are categories, plenty of problems, because they keep changing. They are ephemeral sometimes. Uh, they come and go. So it's very difficult to manage uh, those type of moving uh, targets. But of course, water and wetlands are not blue. They are really brown, because rivers uh, in Colombia carry lots of silt, and that's the color of the rivers in the picture. But hydrologists tell that those rivers are white. That's the name they receive from the literature. There's white rivers, there's black rivers, those from the Amazon, and there's clear rivers. So there's a big problem on defining the ecological attributes of land and the implications of uh, them for building sustainability. Uh, what's the transition that you would like to provide to the people living in wetlands? If there's no map, if the wetlands are not, they do not exist on the mind of the state, there's no policy for fishermen, fishing communities, which at least account for a million of people in, in, in Colombia. Um, so there's not just invisible ecosystems, but invisible people within those ecosystems. Progressive efforts are being done to better identify social groups that should receive particular attention from the state on the basis of their activities on the land. The refinement of such categories is increasingly problematic in a country where inequity provides the incentive to become different just to make use of the opportunities that the history provides. The way for identitarian struggles is paved a mix of ontological and epistemological problems. The approach is also being used to clarify ecological conditions that can be used as an identifier, a marker, therefore inducing a process of clarification of them where everything gets to be relocated. 
who is a real cattle rancher or a cattle producer, who is a peasant, and why peasants don't have the same rights than indigenous groups. Affirmative action creates also lots of conflicts because uh, other people that is poorer than indigenous groups are starting to uh, challenge the policies that protect indigenous groups. So, are you um, an informal miner? Are you uh, a small-scale gold miner? Or are you part of a local community with rights or traditional rights to use or to extract gold? Um, there's kind of the list of what type of people. Um, the very central identity of what is called nature is escaping us because we are trying to define it from inside but leaving us out at the same time. Clearly a paradox. Perhaps the answer lies in the types of knowledge that is being produced, the meanings of such knowledge in the policy arena, the cultural frame that has created it and is until now unable to transform it not just in political decisions, but in a world where we as nature share a place. Clearly a negotiated and non-authoritarian view of the territory, despite calls to science to impose its authority. And this is a book that we also produced last year with the vision of the high mountains ecosystems. There's a law in Colombia that, that uh, forbids oil, mining and agriculture in the peaks, in the Par Paramos it's called, the, the high mountain peaks. So the government asked us to define where are the peaks and to draw a line. So we did it, but we did it for the purpose of management. And there's more than 100,000 people living inside doing agriculture and mining. And suddenly, with the help of Humboldt, there's 100,000 lives at stake. Uh, so I'm, I'm not a cherished person in some places in Colombia, but it's because the law asked us to really draw lines in order to rule and to define what's legal and what's not legal uh, while those ecosystems keep changing and the people living on them are being part of the functions of those ecosystems for a long time. Um, well, Jaguar is, was the symbol of the humans becoming animals in the pre-Hispanic times in order to uh, relate to wild species and to non-human animals and plants. Still, we have jaguars in Colombia, but very few people thinking as jaguars. So why did I start talking about queerness? I, but I hope that you have a, a glimpse on the reasons and, the, and, and why I'm, I am worried about the way we are building scientific knowledge. We are approaching from, bi from biology and natural sciences those issues because Every effort we do to learn about biodiversity, it ends on the opposite, with the opposite effect. It ends with uh, putting uh, the species, putting uh, non-human animals and plants on the spot. And the state and the forces doing management have a clear target to do uh, or to handle them. Uh, in, in the way they want. So my question is, do we have to keep doing uh, research or producing knowledge about uh, nature on the same way that we did in the past? Uh, this is a picture of the, the movie that I saw, I, I show you at the beginning, the meaning of life. Those are the fish and a restaurant person fish, person who fishes, looking at people eating the fish and making jokes about who is next on the plate. Um,
the affinity of queer studies with the quest of ecology has been kind of the central issue or the central subject in this conference. Um, since we, we are talking about the definition of subjects as relational results or effects, but that's not the current way of seeing ecology, where the aggregation of species creates the complex type of networks where biological evolution takes place. Identity is a genetic feature, and ecological and ecological interactions are just a mean for selecting strands, an image of clean, woven, colorful carpet. I don't have to convince you that there is nothing more queer than, uh, than nature, than nature itself. That uh, ADN is not at all stable and produces variety all the time, and it's. Uh, always is moving ahead of focus, uh, that each layer of knowledge about living beings provides evidence that them, as well as the ecological complexity they create, can never be grasped by looking directly to it. We can't see clearly because science puts too much light on it, too much focus. That's what Morton said in 2010 as, and called dark ecology. You cannot see what happens if you look at it. Um, of course, it's completely contrary to what we have been taught in biology. Native ecologies, such as the ayahuasca mind-based technologies, have created a different realm of coexistence for the human and human that may help us to see queer in ecology as a way to place ourselves in a different path of experience and in front of new options for caring for the planet. When we talk with natives, uh, in the Colombian Amazon that use ayahuasca from their childhood, they tell you that reality is not as we think it is. Uh, so their ontologies are completely different than ours or than others people's. And how to negotiate the management or the land, how to negotiate, how to deal with ecological complexity, there is quite a challenge. Um, so I will insist on the idea of layers of meaning that every time we look at an animal, at a plant, at a region, to an object, we are adding a layer. We are putting something additional there. We are almost finished. Okay. Uh, and uh, well, that you know, such as we have learned from many philosophers, knowledge is a sedimentary process. Uh, kind of the ecological evolution through time. But also human activity is uh, kind of adding layers of meaning, of cultural meaning uh, to the land, to the objects and to animals and plants as well. It's kind of onion paleontology. Layers can be used as a solid example of how plants, animals, and microbes assemble themselves in ecological systems. And uh, we can discuss lots on that. But those are not pure objects. Animals never live alone. They create increasingly complex structures with levels of instability that provide room enough for change. Um, the issue is that, or the question, can we derive a real ecological wisdom by adding layers, by adding species and assembling kind of communities, false communities, to understand processes and then to talk about ecological services? Is this approach of adding things good enough for understanding what we call nature? And since I have a little time, I will just show the, the slides where to, to tell or to see how an approach based on understanding body change uh, could be useful to approach ecology, to approach not ecology but ecologists and to help to promote a new type of discussion 
a new type of uh, epistemology about environmental change. Um, Gudinas, who is a philosopher from Uruguay, were questioning mining as a process of amputating uh, landscapes, amputating pieces of the land. But if he talks on that sort of language, we also can talk about prosthetic landscapes. And this is the real landscape that I show you at the beginning of the palms. And this is the landscape that most people want to protect. And there's a discussion. Do we have, do, can we plant avocados in the middle to replace for cattle and to create an artificial forest that would be better than no, no doing anything? Or, or, and to leaving the palms to die alone standing? Um, there's many people thinking that we shouldn't touch this landscape, I mean, the previous landscape. But also we talk lots about enabling disabled bodies and creating new types of anatomies and, uh, and, and, and prosthetics in, 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 in the human body. Um, Probably the discussion has to focus on the purpose. Why are we thinking on doing restoration, ecological restoration, uh, and uh, why do we need to talk about body prosthetics and what kind or types of body and landscape prosthetics can we use? So uh, we need, as always, to discuss with how much of the of our task is given and how much can be creative. And I would like to show you just a picture about the nature for queers in Colombia. There's transgender black persons in black communities. There's transgender peasants in very distant uh, locations and there's transgender indigenous people in almost all the communities. Some of them are expelled from those communities because they are not Indians anymore. They are false women, such as in this case. And those are emerging news. I don't know if, this, if we are talking about uh, issues or historical facts, but we are discovering, what we are discovering is that queerness is all around the country, all around our economic activities, all around our, our decisions about society, and of course, all around the landscape. So I will finish here, thanking for your patience, and uh, thanking again, Jens, for the invitation.
So, yeah. Thank you, thank you for the question. Uh, I have con contradictory feelings on, on, on that issue because uh, there's uh, an, an increase on the extremes on the way we see nature. So what the Constitutional Court is doing, of course, is right. I think that that's the way to go. But to pushing to push the discussion towards that extreme when we are in the middle of uh, kind of more daily questions that, or quotidian uh, challenges just feels uh, kind of the feeling that we are becoming more and more crazy every day. So that, that we are pushing things too far away. And that's kind of the same that Javier asked. Uh, that why do you have to make things more complicated when uh, you can solve them in a more controlled or more friendly way? Which is kind of the, of the same question that my father put to me. Why would you choose to do what you are doing? Why do you choose to be rigid in a very friendly way, of course? Uh, while you could be just a normal person. Said, well, it's because complexity is real. It's something that is on the ground. And if you get so much complexity, you have to face it. You cannot hide it. You cannot try to simplify. So I think that granting rights to nature is fueling a discussion that for many people is quite abstract, but it's creating uh, a new way of looking at things uh, and, and uh, probably will resonate after some time in, in, many, in, in many places. Uh, and, and especially in the young generations, they really, they really are feeling that nature has rights. They are struggling defending those rights and probably the, 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 we are not able to understand uh, this this deep feeling of sympathy with with biodiversity and even the willingness to not uh, transform the landscapes or transform the forest for their uh, for their well-being uh, or or understanding well-being in a very different way. So I think that that will will feed some good discussions. The issue is that legal, the, 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 the legal complications that go behind that. By example, for Humboldt, it makes us defenders of the rights of the rivers or the rights of animals, which we can do, and we are learning how to do that, and we are happy to be put in such position. But for a country that has very little resources, to, to produce knowledge and to respond to all the challenges that we have, uh, it makes feel uh, many people uncomfortable. So we only have time for one last question. Our time is running out since lunch is coming up. So, so uh, hello, my name is Heshin Yun. I'm from Central European University. Um, thank you very much for your fascinating talk. Uh, my question is related to um, the phrase you use uh, from amputating or amputated And I was wondering if uh, what uh, what queer perspectives would give some insight about thinking about prosthetic landscape. Thank you. Thanks. That's a real new discussion we are having about uh, this this the issue of um, adjusting landscapes with prosthetics, uh, and uh, it's especially important to create kind of a dialogue with. Uh, 
the stakeholders in regions which have been really badly transformed or uh, injured uh, for restoration ecology, for example. There's, you can talk a bit about scars, about healing, not just the body or the land, but the, what are the um, possible outcomes or treatments for the land. In some cases, it would be technology. We'll find some, some technology, technological fix for retiring mercury from the rivers or from the lakes to uh, recover destroyed uh, rivers by mining. In some other cases, we will need to build, uh, again, some type of structures. Uh, not the big dams that we pro are promoting, but maybe small fixes around the land and with a very different optic. It could be biomimetic, could be, uh, we don't know. And this perspective, the most important thing is that can promote a discussion between the techno-optimists and other views of the land. What, what is the better pathway to heal the land? How much help you need in terms of spiritual and psychological treatment for healing the wounds? Or how really you need a, a pair of hand crutch? Um, but that's, I invite you to that uh, discussion because it's clearly something uh, arising from the, the, the view of, of a living landscape. But if you allow me, just a small addition, it helps us to discuss the, the issue of prevention. And uh, by example, Colombia has 5 million hectares of savannas, wild savannas, that now are being transformed into agribusiness, such as in Brazil, Uruguay, for producing corn, soy, and uh, animal uh, food for, 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 for cattle and for exports mainly. We are trying to discuss with the big companies the amount of land that, that they may control in terms of their technology and the amount of land that they should live free in terms of ecological processes. And uh, we started asking 50-50. You can only use half of the land to increase agricultural production. And the rest should be left on the wild side. I said, oh, no, that's too expensive. We will lose too much money and uh, we can't do that. So, but are you able, do you, are you willing to discuss the issue? And they said, yes, we can come, try to come to, to uh, uh, an agreement. So that's kind of an, an, an opportunity to really discuss a bit on the shape of the land of the future and what type of trade-offs can we offer based not just on science but also on history, cultural values and, and, and the richness of cultural views. I think on that note, um, Are you I just hungry? want to yes. say thank, thank you. you so much uh, to appreciate for this talk. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much.